Okay. Uh, are my slides showing up? Yeah. Okay. All good. So um, today I'm going to talk entirely about my software package, Big Stream. Um, probably a lot of people in the department have seen little bits of it here and there in other meetings like code review or CVML or the computational methods meeting. But I've never given a presentation that was solely about the software itself. It was always either about a project or a new algorithm I was putting into the software. So I'm going to take this meeting to uh, say all the things that I want to say about what this software has become over the last three years that I've been working on it. Um, here's a big overview slide, and then we'll get into more details down the line. But this is the big picture of what BigStream is. Uh, it's a library of tools for 2D and 3D image registration written in Python. Uh, it contains extremely customizable pipelines. There are thousands of ways to register images using BigStream. Uh, some of those ways would be completely insane, at least based on the data that we have. Uh, but someday there may be some data type where it actually makes the most sense. Um, and those the diverse set of alignment algorithms is not something I built myself necessarily. It's just things that are intrinsically available in the libraries that I'm using in big stream. So it was very economical for me to make all those things available in big stream. It was just a matter of exposing the correct APIs, you know, through Python. Uh, probably the most important aspect of big stream though, is that it scales to clusters and images too large for memory. Uh, it's the only uh, Python-based, at least, image registration package that I'm aware of that was built with that goal in mind from the very start. Uh, and so it's not, it, does, it shouldn't feel like a kludge to get this to run on your terabyte scale images on a cluster. It should feel very natural. Whereas with a lot of the more popular C++ uh, image registration libraries that are used in the medical imaging field and that are also sometimes used in microscopy like CMTK and ANTS. Getting something like that to run on a cluster is kind of a pain in the neck. You have to write a lot of bash scripts. You have to communicate uh, using files on the file system and it just doesn't feel very natural. So um, Big Stream was originally part of the EasyFish project here at Genelia. That's where it really got started. Um, I've used it for a lot of other things, and I'm going to talk about those other things in some uh, future slides. Uh, like I said, it's in some, several publications already. And then it's currently being used in projects here uh, at UCLA, MIT, Chinese Institute for Brain Research, a biotech company in Silicon Valley, Harvard, the Allen Institute. These are just the projects that I know about, uh, but based on the GitHub statistics, it's definitely being used in other places. There are a lot of people I've never talked to or I don't know anything about them who've posted questions and uh, a few pull requests and stuff like that, which is makes me feel really good. And that's another reason why I, I want to talk about this software for this meeting is I think that this year and next year are the years where it turns the corner and starts really picking up community adoption. And Eventually, hopefully, it's not entirely in my hands. It would be very nice if there was a small developer community supporting it uh, so that I'm not having to do all the troubleshooting and all the feature uh, additions and things like that. It's been used on data from multiple organisms, Fly as well. Uh, I haven't published a paper or been part of a project that's gotten that far with Fly, but I have registered some Fly data for uh, some people who've just come to me for help. Um, and then the real contribution from a software standpoint of Big Stream is that it combines Simple IT, ITK and Dask to scale all of the algorithms in Simple ITK to cluster size problems. Uh, and then it also contains the logic to smooth those things back together. When you parallelize something over the cluster, you're doing a bunch of independent computations, and then they need to be reconciled into one object. And Big Stream contains all the logic for doing that as well. Uh, to elaborate a little further on that, I like this analogy uh, lately. That if, if Big Stream was a car, Simple ITK would be the engine. It contains all the key image registration algorithms that are used in diverse ways in Big Stream. So rigid alignments, affine alignments, deformable alignments. And then, like I said, thousands of ways to do those types of alignments. You can change how the optimization is done. There are like five different types of gradient descent. There are non-gradient based optimizations like evolutionary optimization, the amoeba algorithm. There are second order optimizations like the, I always forget this acronym, Broiden, the BFLGS or whatever it's called. It's, that's a second order optimization like Newton's method. 
And then in addition to the simple ITK ones, which are like 95% of the alignments available in Bigstream, there's some non-simple ITK ones available as well, like feature point extraction plus ransack and then random affine search. And um, those aren't available in simple ITK, I think primarily because most of the motivating examples behind the development of ITK were medical imaging data sets. And those are usually very, compared to what we collect in microscopy, smooth images. So like MRIs of the brain or X-rays of the chest, CTs of the abdomen. These contain, relative to what we collect, a large, you know, a, 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 a relatively small set of big, smooth things but in microscopy data, we usually collect a huge set of small, non-smooth things, cells versus organs. Uh, and these algorithms like feature point extraction plus ransack are, are much better suited for that type of data. But that's why they're not in, in simple ITK. That's another advantage, I guess I would say, of Big Stream is that it, it has all of this stuff available. And when you combine them, you can do some pretty interesting things. Uh, OK, so if simple ITK is the engine, then DASC would be the transmission. It takes the power of those registration algorithms and routes it in parallel to, you know, whatever resources you have, whether it's a workstation or a cluster. And um, at, uh, at least implicitly, any cluster manager that's supported by Dask and Dask Job Queue can be uh, used in Big Stream. And that is a pretty, it has pretty good coverage of what's out there, I think. It includes some cluster managers I've never even heard of before, like Moab. I, I don't know what Moab is. I don't know what institute types of institutes it's used at. But like the major academic ones that I know about, like SGE, Slurm, and uh, LSF, are all supported. So if Simple ITK is the engine and if Dask is the transmission, then Bigstream is trying to be the rest of the car. It wants to connect the engine to the transmission, route uh simple ITK registration algorithms to uh you know parallel resources. Uh it wants to be used in diverse ways to make an arbitrary composition of many different types of alignments from different libraries even uh possible even with one function call. Uh, and then it builds those things into uh really specific application uh areas like the original uh, idea behind it, distributed piecewise alignment for massive images. You want to register two data sets that are both huge, so you break it up into blocks over the spatial domain and align each of those blocks independently, then stitch it together. But now it also has motion correction, which is a related thing. It's just instead of breaking, you know, one, two huge 3D data sets up, you're breaking one huge 4D data set up and you're just breaking it along the time axis and you're registering each frame each time point to uh, a common target. And then stitching. Stitching is just like the distributed piecewise alignment in that you have an image that's broken along the spatial domain and you have to do alignments within the spatial domain. So uh, big stream is a really natural fit for all of these types of problems where you have to do lots of registrations uh, on, on one big array and break that array up and then smooth everything back together somehow. Uh, okay, here's an outline for the rest of this presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about the big stream package and module design, like how, what, how the algorithms and the pieces that they're built out of are, are organized. My goal is to try to convince you that it's a really accessible modular package, that there's sort of different entry points into the hierarchy, hierarchy of functions in this package, that and at each one of those entry points, there's a set of users who are trying to be served. People who are doing simple, small in-memory registration will be happy with BigStream. People who are doing big out-of-memory registration on clusters will be happy with BigStream. People doing motion correction will be happy with BigStream. Uh, and I want to show that like each that there's an entry point into the package for each of those communities. Uh, align, then I'm going to talk about the alignment functions and the alignment pipeline, getting more specific into the API for a couple of the key functions. Uh, and then the distributed versions of those functions. So what if you want to run these things on a cluster? And then I'm going to talk about projects that I've been a part of that have used BigStream within the last like year. Uh, and then probably what I think is the most important part of the presentation, which is much needed for their work, because I'm obviously trying to sell you on this software. I've worked really hard on it. I think it has a lot of value, but there's some critical things that are not good enough about it and that I really would like to either get help with or convince people that it's worth doing that work um, so that I can support an even larger number of users and, and have the software be even more self-supported and autonomous uh, in the future. Okay, so let's talk about the package and module design. 
Um, I'm going to build up a hierarchy of uh, modules within this package that are each each new layer is dependent on the layers below it. And so the, the base layer here are these two modules called configure IRM and utility. Configure IRM, IRM stands for image registration method, is just a wrapper around a simple ICK object. And this image registration method is extremely, it's a big object. It contains the possibility of doing thousands of different types of alignments. Like I said, with different optimization options, different ways of comparing two images to each other, different ways of subsampling the images during optimization, um, different transform models, rigid, affine, deform, different types of deforms, different types of rigids. <laughs> it's very rich. Uh, it contains 30 years worth of, of image registration development at Kitware is all exposed in this API. As you can imagine, that's pretty complicated. And so I wrap it in a way that I hope makes it more digestible for the typical uh, you know, newbie to image registration. A lot of defaults are set for you. Actually interacting with the image registration object is totally abstracted away in big stream. You're, you're not even aware most of the time that you're dealing with simple ITK in big stream. But if a power user really wants to get into the weeds, then they can learn the image registration method API and 100% of it is accessible in big stream. Uh, okay, so then utility uh, is sort of just necessary basics, file input, output, and format conversions, and then transform object type conversions. So like I said, all the inputs and outputs for big stream, they, they, I aspire for all of them to be NumPy arrays and ZAR arrays. That's it. I only want the user to be aware of those two types of, of inputs and outputs. And But behind the scenes, Simple ITK has a bunch of types of objects that it cares about. So affine transform is an object, rigid transform is an object under a different name, but it's an object. Deformable transform is an object. I want the user to think of all of those things as NumPy arrays, because that's what the typical Python user is already familiar with. So utility.py contains a bunch of functions, like, I don't know, dozens of functions that just convert between these things. They contain all the necessary conventions for access order, um, metadata specification so that a user can just put in an umpire array and then Bigstream figures out what it is and turns it into the correct type of simple ITK object. Okay, built on top of these things, the most important module in the whole package probably is align.py. This uses the image registration method and other libraries to define a lot of different types of alignment problems. Uh, rigid affines deformables, searching over the affine space randomly, uh, and the feature point plus ransack uh, algorithm. Uh, and then it has this thing in it called the alignment pipeline interface, which is a way of in one function call composing an arbitrary number of these previous types of alignments together. And that's a very powerful tool. Uh, it gives the user access to like many different types of doing alignment with just one function call and you get one set of inputs and one output. Uh, and I'm the most important user of this function because you'll see in a minute that that this is what enables me to very easily distribute alignments over large arrays is by having this very clean uh, alignment pipeline API. Uh, okay, then there's transform.py. Everything in align.py takes images as input and whatever parameters you want for your alignment and returns a transform object. Uh, that specifies how the two images are related but it doesn't resample anything for you. Transform.py handles all of that. So it deals with applying and working with transforms. So it'll apply transforms to an image or coordinates. Maybe you've registered two image data sets, but in the moving image coordinate system, you've also extracted a bunch of things like the locations of points of interest or um, surface geometry. You've done segmentation and then like marching cubes, you have some, some geometry file. All of those things can be transformed using transform.py. It composes transforms together. Maybe you've done multiple alignments in Bigstream. Maybe you've done alignments in other software packages as well. Big Stitcher, um, Big Warp. Uh, all of these things, these transforms from all of these uh, packages should be with a little bit of effort uh, digestible into Bigstream and then can are compatible with Bigstream transforms. So they can all be composed into one transform object if you like. And inverting transforms. Inverting affine matrices is trivial. In fact, there's no function in Bigstream for it because there's already one in the linear algebra package for NumPy. It would be silly and redundant to just wrap it. 
but inverting deformation vector fields is non-trivial. That's uh, a complicated numerical algorithm with iterations and uh, bounds on precision. And that's available in transform.py as well. Uh, and then the last thing on this layer of the hierarchy are these three kind of side things, features, level set, and metrics. These aren't registration related per se. They're just useful tools for helping make registrations easier, faster, and better. So functions like blob detection, which is what I use for feature point extraction, when I want to find like a bunch of the cells in the image and then use them as feature points to compute an alignment. Foreground segmentation, which is really important for distributed alignment on big images, because you don't want to waste any compute resources on portions of the image that don't contain foreground. If I do whole brain zebrafish all the time, and 60% of the imaging field of view, approximately 60% of the imaging field of view is just background. And that's because of the shape of the zebrafish brain. It's not a rectangle. So you, you, you use the minimally inscribing rectangle. You still have a ton of background. Um, and we don't want to waste any time cutting that background up into little cubes and sending it out to our, our distributed um, uh, resources just for them to come back and say there's no data here. We just don't want to try to align them in the first place. So foreground segmentation can be really important for these types of alignments. And then metrics contains a bunch of uh, image metrics that are not in simple ITK, ways of comparing two images to each other um, that indicate how well aligned they are or not. There's a good set of those in ITK, but there are a few I've come up with that are kind of weird and like special for, for, for specific circumstances uh, that I've had to build myself. Okay, now these purple ones, so like is, let me, uh, taking a step back, if you just want to work with the simple ITK registration method, you can use confirm IRM on its or configure IRM on its own. Or if you just have a bunch of simple ITK stuff and you want to learn the conventions for how to go between simple ITK objects and more intuitive representation of the data in NumPy, then utility is a good package to look at or a good module to look at. Everything in green is if you're just doing stuff in memory. I have two images of the zebrafish brain or two images of, of a chunk of mouse cortex, and they're small enough to fit into memory. You can work with big stream and only ever use these green ones and you'll be very happy. Um, but if you want to do really big data stuff, then you'll need these purple modules. So piecewise align and piecewise transform are the distributed analogs of align and transform. They distribute the alignment pipeline interface, which gives you access to the entire align.py module with a single function call over blocks to arbitrary compute resources using Dask. And then piecewise transform does the same thing, but for all of the functions in transform. So if you want to apply a really big transform to a really big image to resample the image, then and you want to do it in parallel, then this is what you would call. Uh, same thing for coordinates. You want to apply a really big transform to coordinate data that's in piecewise transform as well. There's also motion correction, like I said, which is, is very similar to aligning two big 3D data sets. You just break the image up over a different axis. It's actually easier in that sense because smoothing the result back together into one object is much easier since you're breaking over independently collected frames. Uh, Stitch.py, this is in, I would say, is in beta. It's not finished being built yet. And I should also mention that this is a really well-developed area of bioinformatics. Big Stitcher is really great, and so are all the Solfeld lab tools for stitching. Uh, there's others out there, too. Uh, it's really only present in Big Stream because the ingredients for it were there, and now I can work entirely within my own software package and have the nice feeling of control over everything when I'm stitching and aligning data sets. But it's, like I say, still in beta. Uh, and needs a little bit more work before it's ready to be used off the shelf for new people. And then applications, pi application pipelines. This is like combinations of everything below it. So the algorithm used in the EasyFish project is not just like one function call in align.py, it's multiple and it's done at multiple scales. We, register, we do easy registrations on low resolution data followed by harder registrations on high resolution data. And that whole workflow is available in application pipelines from a function that's literally called easy fish registration pipeline. And I'll eventually put in like zebrafish registration pipeline as well, like additional pipelines for projects that have been published using big stream where people want to learn exactly how the alignment was done. Those will be in application pipelines. Okay.
That's it for package and module design, but let's take a somewhat closer look at the alignment functions and the alignment pipeline. Uh, here's the four sort of fundamental alignment functions available in the align.py uh, uh, module. Searching for affine matrices randomly by specifying bounds on how much translation, rotation, scale, and shear you'll allow and then the total number of iterations you want to look for, that's just going to generate a large random set of affine matrices, apply them one by one to the moving image, compare that to the fixed image, and return the best N. You can, there's a, should be a, a parameter in here somewhere saying like return, how many do you want to return? Just one transform or the top 10 or the top 20 or whatever, so that you can then look at them and decide what's the best result from that random search. Feature point ransack affine align. So this is extract a bunch of feature points from both images and then find a single affine transform that puts the largest number of feature points on top of each other. Affine align, this is affine or rigid. There's a flag here to set it to be restricted to only translation or rotation. Uh, and this is a gradient descent based optimization. Uh, and then deformable align, this is a B-spline parameterized deformable uh, registration. So it's a pretty smooth alignment. Now, these function signatures are pretty long. There's a lot of parameters in here that might look intimidating, but most of them are set to really easy defaults. They're available to be customized in case something about your data is weird and needs to be, uh, and the parameters need to be changed. And I'm trying, I've tried to make the APIs for these functions as consistent with each other as possible. So the, the first four arguments are always the same, the fixed and moving image and their voxel spacings. These four things can all be called in composition in arbitrary order from the alignment pipeline uh, function. So again, same first four inputs, fixed move and their voxel spacings. And then steps, which we'll see an example of in a second, tells the, the pipeline which of these functions to call and in what order and how to parameterize each one. So here's an example of using the alignment pipeline. Uh, the first thing I do is I grab some data, then I define two sets of parameters, one for a ransack that calls this function, and one for an affine that calls this function. There are defaults for the parameters for those two alignments here in A, B, but the user can also override those defaults or provide additional arguments that aren't present in the defaults through these uh, global ransack keyword args and global affine keyword args. Those are um, arguments to the function that this code snippet was you know, extra stolen from. And then uh, you call the uh, alignment pipeline, you give it the two data sets, the two voxel spacings, and this steps list. Uh, this steps list can be arbitrarily long. I've run it with up to six different um, alignment algorithms in it. And uh, you can also specify with alignment pipeline how you want it to deal with the transforms you get. Do you want to compose them all together into one result, or do you want them to each each transform from each step to be returned separately? Do you want to compress all affines into one affine and all deformables into one deformable, but keep those things separate? There's multiple ways of getting your result back. Okay, let's look at the distributed functions. Um, there's pretty much an analog of everything from align.py in distributed or in piecewise align.py. This is the key function there, distributed piecewise alignment pipeline. And that's a verbose name, but I hope it conveys exactly what it is. It calls that alignment pipeline function, which in turn has access to all of the alignment capabilities in align.py on blocks and distributes those blocks out to the uh, whatever resources you have available. Anything in big stream that's tagged with this decorator at cluster is going to run with a cluster object available. That could be the actual cluster, like our LSF cluster. It could be uh, an AWS instance. It could be uh, your own workstation. Uh, and then you're treating your workstation like a cluster. Maybe you've got 16 cores, or if you're lucky, you got a beefy workstation with 32 cores or something like that. Then uh, Dask will still treat that like a cluster and distribute resources to uh, that set of cores in parallel, or however many of them you'll allow it to. You'll see in a minute there's a mechanism in BigStream for defining what your cluster is and how it should be broken up into workers and things like that. 
jumping ahead, that's one of the things that really sucks about Big Stream right now is that how that's done is not really accessible to average users. It really needs to be done in a way that's better, more intuitive, more clear, more automated. Uh, but right now, at least everything can be specified, but it's not in the in the best way, I would say. Okay, so the, you've got this uh, the sort of original distributed uh, um, function. Then if you need to apply transforms to big data sets, that's available to be distributed as well. Motion correction, uh, stitching. And then, like I said, there's the easy fish registration pipeline. This is not tagged with the cluster decorator, but that's because the functions inside of this, the ones that are called inside of this are tagged with at cluster. Also, um, when a function's tagged with at cluster, it's required that it takes these two arguments as input, cluster and cluster keyword arguments. Cluster can be a cluster object you've already created. So if you're calling multiples of these functions in a row, like you're going to do your distributed piecewise alignment, and then right after that, you're going to resample the data, you might want to just create a cluster object yourself and then pass that as an input to these two functions. And if you do that, the functions won't try to create their own cluster. They'll just give the one that was handed. They'll just use the one that was handed to them. And then cluster keyword arguments uh, specifies how the function should create its own cluster if it needs to. And that's what's going on in EasyFish registration pipeline. It's calling these functions, or, or really this one and this one, um, and you're specifying how to build clusters through the cluster keyword arguments. Uh, the logic for all of these distributed things is the same. Break the input into compute blocks over the appropriate axes. For large 3D images, those are the three spatial axes. For motion correction, that's the time axis. For stitching, the image is already broken up into blocks for you. It's the set of mosaics, the individual tiles, or the, the individual tiles that were collected by the microscope. Run the alignment pipeline or the resample function in the apply transform case on each block separately, and then merge all of those results into in the appropriate way for whatever it is that you did. Combine all of the resampled blocks into one continuous image. Uh, combine the transforms you created into one continuous array. And then return that somehow to the user. Uh, here's an example of using the distributed piecewise alignment pipeline. It's highly parameterized, obviously. There's a lot of stuff that had to be chosen here to make this work well. Uh, this alignment pipeline call has two steps, an affine alignment and a deformable alignment. Those are in this steps uh, list right here. And then lots of arguments for how the cluster is going to be used. The entire Dask cluster configuration API is exposed in cluster keyword arguments. So you specify like obvious things like how long you want your workers to remain alive minimum and who's going to pay the bill, how many CPUs a worker is made out of, how many threads a worker is allowed to run concurrently, the minimum and maximum number of workers you'll allow at any time. This cluster is going to adapt um, uh, automatically during the computation based on how much work it's given. So you're going to submit a ton of tasks to the cluster and it's going to go, okay, I need at least this many workers and I can go up this high. Usually it'll ramp up to the max. And then as tasks finish, it'll start releasing workers as there's less work to do, uh, which is a nice cost saving measure. Uh, if you're doing something where like a lot of the work comes in asynchronously, you don't want to hold on to a bunch of idle workers while the last few are just finishing up. Um, and then this config in here is, like I said, there's like hundreds of options for this. Dask is has a million little things inside of it that you can change that influence how how things run on different types of clusters. And sometimes you need to really fiddle with those in order to get your distributed computation to work in a way that is efficient and predictable and fast and snappy. And uh, unfortunately, these aren't even necessarily documented all that well because there's lots of them. And I think the Dask developers somehow assume that, oh, users won't ever need this because they'll be doing things the way we do things. But, you know, people always come up with ways of using your software that you didn't intend, <laughs> which means they need to tweak things in ways that you didn't tweak. And so uh, it's nice that these things are there. And it's also nice that I've suffered through learning how to use them. And so actually in a couple of weeks, I think on the 14th, I'm going to give a talk in the computational methods meeting where I'll discuss like how I painstakingly learned how to use a lot of some of the some of them are well documented. I should give the Dask team lots of credit. Dask is great. The documentation is rich, 
that it's just too big of a thing to really learn how to use from reading documentation alone. You have to play with it. And so I'll talk about it in two weeks or, you know, on the 14th in computational methods, like what some of these things are, how they solve certain types of problems with using Dask uh, and so on. All right, so all of that stuff gets bundled together and we submit this distributed piecewise alignment that aligns two big images, fix and move, as big as can fit on the cluster. So these could be, you know, 100 terabytes, depending on how much RAM you've got. Um, and uh, you specify a block size, how the image gets broken up into blocks. And then we specified the alignment algorithm to run on each block through the, the steps input. Okay. That's it for, for code. That was a lot of slides with just a bunch of text on it. I, I was trying to convey sort of the logical organization of Big Stream, trying to keep it very accessible at different layers of the hierarchy using just the fundamental things, just the in-memory alignment size things, just the distributed things, or going all the way up to custom pipelines like motion correction or the EasyFish pipeline. I'm hoping to support people at every layer of that hierarchy. Uh, and I hope that it wasn't completely confusing or unclear uh, from just showing like the function definitions like that. Okay, let's talk about the projects that Bigstream has been used for over the last year. Uh, there was the original one, the EasyFish project. There are two publications out on this already, one in Cell and one in eLife. Uh, and in addition to uh, Genelia, Bigstream is used for EasyFish projects at Cornell and UCSD now. And that's because the first author, Yuhan, is now an assistant professor at Cornell. And Scott Sternson is now a full professor at UCSD. Uh, and both of those labs are continuing to use Bigstream for, for new projects there. Um, <clears throat> this is the project that I have a lot more ownership of. It's what continues pushing the development of Bigstream. It's what all the things I put into Bigstream are designed for. Then they get mutated because other people want to use them. And then I have to go, wait a minute, you want to do this on that what kind of image? And then I have to like, rewrite a bunch of stuff for them too. But this is what I build Bigstream for are these zebrafish images. Um, for this project, we've collected almost 100 terabytes of data already. Uh, we've collected uh, single cell transcript data for 60 different genes from six different fish. Uh, those fish have gone through five different stimulus and behavior experimental conditions. So the, each one of the fish in this in this project was had whole brain single cell re resolution calcium imaging, followed by the Easy Fish protocol. So for every cell in the brain, we know uh, 30 genes per fish, but 60 different genes when you account for the whole data set. For each cell, we know how many copies of the of a particular gene transcript were present and what that cell was doing for five different stimulus and behavior experimental conditions. And the goal is to determine whether certain um, genotypes are associated with certain functional roles. Cells that are important for turning left express these genes. That's a, not gonna be something we ever conclude from the data set, but that's the, the general idea. <clears throat> Can we define cell types based on expression? And does that map in an interesting way Onto, onto the function. So this video is a visualization of GAD and VGLUT expression throughout the whole zebrafish brain. GAD's in blue and VGLUT's in purple, or maybe the other way around. I never remember which one is which. Th those are important genes because they indicate for the cell whether it's excitatory or inhibitory on downstream targets. Uh, this video shows 11 different rounds of EasyFish protocol all registered together. So every time it kind of flashes or you see the like grid artifact, the stitching artifact on top of it move around, that's an entirely different image. And <clears throat> those 11 different images from this video were collected over the course of like three months. So there's a lot of data actually being shown in this, in this video. But for me, the beauty of it is it doesn't look like that. It looks like just the same brain with like the lighting changing. But that's exactly how a, a registration should look, super accurate. And <clears throat> I'm showing a very downsampled version of this, but these alignments are done with a less than 200 nanometer precision on volumes that are approximately one centimeter long on, on each axis. Th if you had asked me if this was possible when I was just finishing my PhD, I would have said no way, that you could register this much data this accurately with a, containing a pattern this complicated. And I'm maybe patting myself on the back a little bit too much, but I'm still impressed that the tools actually work to do this after putting in the work to actually test them and build them. It, it all works the way that it should. And, and you get alignments that are nice and clean over these rounds. Uh, and then finally, like I said, we also have functional data for these fish. So this visualization is showing the original functional data. That's the more blurry stuff. 
panning over to a confocal image of the same brain that's been registered to the functional data. And since it's the same cells in the same brain, I project the functional data onto the confocal image and you see a, a much clearer delineation of, of cells. And like I said, the goal of this project is to have everything in one place, all the genes from all the different rounds, all the functional data, and then ask those questions, which cell types are interesting, which functional groups are have express unique or, or, or interesting things that we didn't know about. This project will be written up and submitted this year. Uh, and we have that our initial pub, uh, submission is going to be about three out of our six fish. But there are three more that we just finished with an entirely new set of genes. Uh, <clears throat> and we have this protocol pretty much down pat. I think each fish probably costs less than a couple thousand dollars to collect. I would love to collect a lot more because there are a lot more than 60 genes in the zebrafish brain. Uh, and it would be very interesting to look at genes that are uh, have homologs in other organisms, brain regions that have homologs in other organisms. It would be very cool to produce an atlas from data like this with a hundred fish with thousands of different genes uh, and have all that be accessible on the internet. This is my dream for this project is that it grows into a large data collection and processing effort uh, because we have really optimized the protocol for collecting this data very um, painstakingly. Okay. Um, so I also use BigStream to participate in a challenge uh, at the beginning of the year called the Robust Non-Rigid Registration for Expansion Microscopy Challenge. It was part of ISB 2023. Um, about 10 teams participated. There were more people who signed up. There's like 25 teams, but a bunch of people just didn't actually submit anything. So there were about 10 teams that actually submitted uh, alignments. And the alignment accuracy was scored by the Dice Sorensen coefficient of manual annotations. So you have a fixed and a moving image. They, the same person, an, pardon me, annotates the same cells in both the fixed and the moving image. The um, participant aligns the two data sets and then um, the or challenge organizers check the labels. Did you map the same, the correct labels on top, to, on top of each other? Um, it worked out that BigStream was the most accurate and the fastest method overall. So uh, they gave me this nice certificate and an iPad which I have not opened. It has sat on my desk for like six months. I have no use for it. Uh, maybe my son eventually will, will get to use it, but uh, I'll figure out what to do with it later. Um, okay, so another project that I've used BigStream for was a collaboration with the Zapersky Lab at UCLA. Um, Dr. Zabersky, who I, I don't know his first name, unfortunately, is an HHMI investigator. And a lot of Janelians have matriculated to his lab, actually. Uh, when you look at his lab personnel page, I recognize a few faces. Um, but they approached Conrad initially because they had some data they were using in the EasyFish pipeline, which contains BigStream, that they were unable to register. So I did the registrations for them using BigStream uh, directly. I did a proof of concept alignment, which was only took a, uh, maybe three days. And it's only accurate enough to prove that like BigStream can solve your problem. And if you really want to make it super accu accurate, you should learn the software to a higher level of, of a understanding and improve on the result that I've given you. That This is how I, I want to interact with external labs to Genelia. I don't want to solve the problem for them. I want to show them how to solve the problem themselves by getting them 90% of the way there and, and seeing them do the last 10%. And that hopefully gives them enough training in BigStream to then solve their next alignment themselves. This alignment was three different steps, a global affine, local affine and local deformable. And in each case, I'm using the alignment uh, pipeline interface. You see the steps argument being defined in each case uh, to execute the alignment. Uh, another project is at the Chinese Institute of Brain Research. Um, Rong Gong was a, I guess, postdoc in Scott Sternson's lab. And now she's a group leader at the Chinese Institute for Brain Research. Uh, they sent us a sample that is really unusual in the sense that it's very, very thin. There are only 52 slices along the, the Z axis, but thousands of voxels along the X and the Y axes. So it for expansion microscopy data, that's really weird. They did it as a test. They didn't want to image huge samples. They want to just collect a quick image. So they only collected 52 slices. That's actually smart, but... I never predicted it. So I had to do some additional modifying of big stream in order to get this uh, alignment to work up to proof of concept level. Um, but I've sent that back to them. I probably should interact with them a little bit more soon and see how things are going and get back involved. 
uh, but at least they have one example of how to successfully do this alignment uh, in in you know Python script form uh, that they can jump off from. Uh, there's also the EasyFish NextFlow pipeline, which is entirely Conrad and Christian's work. I'm really grateful that BigStream is even a part of it. Um, Christian put a lot of work into keeping the EasyFish pipeline. Uh, I'm constantly adding stuff to BigStream and fixing bugs and things like that. And it's probably galls Christian a little bit that like I'm stuff's always moving around or, or changing because uh, it would be great if this NextFlow pipeline was like, more firm and versioned and and uh, it's hard for me to work that way with big stream although although i'm learning and getting better at it uh, but this plugs big stream into a workflow that also includes stitching uh cell segmentation spot detection and spot to cell assignment uh and the goal is to support people doing expansion microscopy just like in the easy fish publication so that they have one chunk of software that can handle almost all the processing they need which is really generous of us to offer because it's hard software processing. We're talking about terabyte scale images, working with clusters, doing running complicated algorithms. It really takes a full-time computer scientist in your lab to make that stuff successful or a really good software product like the EasyFish NextFlow pipeline. Um, here's all the, the big stream users that I have worked with in the last year. Um, I guess Conrad and Christian should be on this slide too, but they're here and they're here. <laughs> Um, but like I said, I think there's more because of the GitHub statistics. Uh, somebody from the Allen Institute accidentally submitted a pull request to my big stream repository. It was clear from the content of the um, pull request and from the message or the lack thereof that th what they intended to do was submit the pull request to their own branch or their own fork, but accidentally submitted it to me. I had never met this person before and it contained like thousands of lines of new code that they had had written in order to customize big stream algorithms for their own application and get it to run on their Slurm cluster. So it was bittersweet to see that pull request and think, oh, I would love to have some of this stuff in big stream. I would love to have Slurm cluster support. I would love to talk to you about getting this um, running at the Allen Institute well, but they seem to be doing it on their own. And that's, I guess, a good thing. Uh, okay, so much needed further work. Uh, I'm giving you the best possible view of Big Stream and and trying to sell it as a really useful tool. I think it is a really useful tool. I've put, put a lot of work into it and people are starting to adopt it and use it. But there are things that it's really missing that would make it a much better experience for newer users. One is continuous uh, integration with GitHub Actions. I talked to Don about this and I know that it's possible. It's just a simple matter of learning how to do it and doing the programming, which I have not made time for, but it's important because the, the version of Big Stream in my local copy of the repository is always the best one and the most up-to-date. The GitHub is always a little bit behind, but usually pretty close to the cutting edge. And then the one on, on, on PyPy is sometimes months behind because I just, whenever I make a commit, it's a real pain in the neck to have to repackage and re-upload to PyPy. So it's pretty common for users to email me and go, do I have the latest? And then that'll motivate me to actually run the update. But it I would be great if it just all happened automatically. Um, automated HTML documentation from the doc strings would also be great. I don't know about you guys, but the way I usually interact with Python package documentation is, is on the internet. I look at like numpy.org and things like that. I'm not usually looking at source code or doc strings directly. I have really verbose and hopefully clear doc strings for most of the key functions. They're always a little bit behind. I'll make feature bug fixes and feature additions to a function and then not update the doc string. So I have to do a sweep every once in a while and check how consistent they are. But um, they're pretty good. And I have a lot of them for the key functions. But like I said, to read them, you have to either open the source code or like call function question mark and have it Python printed out for you itself. Um, and it should be easier. It should be easier to find. I just don't know how to do this. So this is like something I would love to spend a few days learning about, but don't really feel like I have time to do. I would love to sort of have permission from the other stakeholders in my work time to, to do this kind of stuff to support Big Stream. Uh, I wanna use standard formats for the ZAR files. All of the big transforms and image big image resamplings get saved as ZAR files, but not using any conventional format. It's just blocked. There's no group, data, no data set organization in it, and no metadata. You have to just know what's in that file, or it's a total waste of space. 
I would love to have it be in a more conventional format. And I, I'm, I, I think the uh, open microscopy environments and GFF czar is an appealing choice for this. And so I spent a few days trying to get this package from Kitware or Matt McCormick to work with BigStream. And on smaller data sets, it does work, but really big data sets, there's some DASC limitations that make this really painful. And so I'm hopefully going to work with Matt to iron some of those out. I'm basically going to chop out a bunch of the DASC that's in his package, demonstrate for him that this is much more performant, and then see if he's willing to, to do things that way. Instead of like the way this is built right now is like very consistent with what DASC tells you you should do. It just doesn't perform on large 3D data sets. And there are lots of um, shortcuts or workarounds that I've found to make things performant that basically sidestep DASC and make, um, and actually make things work in a, in a more uh, uh, efficient way. Uh, and then I want to support more cluster environments. So like I said, this is the Dask job queue uh, API. I use the LSF cluster object to communicate with our cluster at Genelia. I guess Alan is using this Slurm cluster object to communicate with their Slurm cluster, but I haven't built anything for Slurm. Uh, and then there's a local cluster object, which is what's used if you're just running on a workstation. But there's obviously more of these. There are plenty of universities that use SGE. I don't know what most of these others are, HT Condor and Moab and stuff. But I don't know. I guess if I found if I had a good test environment for these, then I could build a small wrapper for each one of these classes and plug them into BigStream so it would work automatically. But right now, it's basically LSF or, or wrap your own cluster object. And it would be nice to automatically support more of these so that users don't need to uh, do any coding at all to get it to run on their own cluster. And the last one is a more intuitive design for specifying the compute environment. You saw this nasty block of red code with all these Dask config options and stuff in the example I showed for the distributed piecewise alignment pipeline. The way that all this stuff is specified right now, you have to be knowledgeable about your cluster. You have to be knowledgeable about your uh, the problem you're solving, how much RAM you're going to need, how how big how big are each block in terms of, of gigabytes or megabytes that you're breaking the image up into, how long is the alignment going to take for each one of those blocks, and you have to set these parameters accordingly. Even before that, you have to know if you're running on a workstation or a cluster. And this cluster keyword args looks very different in those two contexts, as you can imagine. The specifications you need to run on your workstation versus running on a cluster are very different. And this, this system is really bad. The only reason it works is because I know what I'm doing. And then I have to teach people to, that so that they know what they're doing. But a lot of this stuff could be done automatically by just inspecting the inputs. Oh, the image is this big. The specified block sizes are this big. That's approximately this many gigabytes. That means each worker needs this much RAM. All that stuff can be programmed. It's 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 very logical. Um, and to really support users without forcing them to learn more about their cluster, I, you know, part of me likes that. You should learn. <laughs> you should learn some computer science and some HPC. Uh, but without having to force them to do that, I it would be nice to take some time to make this easier to do uh, for downstream users. Okay, that's it. That's everything that I wanted to show you. Um, I'm done.